Hey, I want to welcome everyone to our podcast series, Lime Time in Texas. My name is Dale Wren. I'm the Executive Director of the Lime Association of Texas, and I'm going to talk today about what makes clay soil unique and what makes lime the best uh, stabilization choice when you're, when you're dealing with clay soil. So I, I titled this next slide Introduction and Summary because it kind of tells you everything that you need to know about what's going to be in this presentation. So there's four things that really make clay soils unique. Uh, first of all, clay soils have really tiny, tiny, tiny sized particles. Uh, they have a huge surface area. They have a real strong affinity to attract water. And uh, the fourth one we say is they're made primarily, and not everybody knows this, but, uh, but clay is made primarily of, of uh, silica and alumina. So those are kind of the four things that kind of make uh, clay soils unique. And then what makes lime the best stabilization choice for clay soils is it's the only product that is almost 100% free calcium oxide and indu indu induces the pozzolanic reaction uh, calcium aluminate hydrate and calcium silicate hydrate, which is basically forming cement. It's a pozzolanic cement that you're forming. Uh, it kills the clay swell and adds permanent strength and performance. So it's really the only uh, product that's out there that's, that can, can do all of those things at one time. I want to talk, start off by talking about soil particle size and talk about some of the common types of soils that we have in Texas. Uh, gravel, uh, sand, silt, and clay. That's really the kind of the four categories. I'm going to start off by mentioning, I'm going to jump in the middle of this and talk about sand which if you look at sand, it's about one millimeter uh, in, in width there. A millimeter, to give you an idea, so there's 25.4 millimeters in one inch. Uh, the, uh, the sand particle is about the same size as the width of a sewing needle, so that's about the smallest that sand gets. Now, once sand gets up to about two millimeters, it's considered to be gravel, so the, the next one beside it, now gravel starts at about two millimeters, goes on up, but it can be up as, as high as about two and a half inches or so, so gravel gets quite large. When you're talking about clay, I'm going to introduce a term, uh, some, a measurement here called a micron because clay is about one micron. So to give you an idea what a micron is, there's a thousand microns in one millimeter. So it would take a thousand particles of clay just to crawl across that sewing needle there. So that gives you an idea of what the, the clay size is there. Uh, so in fact, it's so small that it's not even visible on this screen right there. So also to kind of put this in perspective, a human hair is about 100 microns. So it take about 10 human hairs to go across there. So here's some pictures uh, showing two different types of clays. Kaolinite is the one on the left here. Now this is magnified 2,000 times here. And just to give you an idea, so the size of those particles are two tenths of a micron up to two microns. So that gives you an idea that it's a really small, small particle and it can have a surface area up to 30 square meters. So I mentioned at the introduction, it has a really, it's a tiny particle, it has huge surface area. Another common type of clay is montmorillonite. Uh, and these flakes of montmorillonite, the largest one that you see is about one micron in size, and they can go down to a hundredth of a micron. So these things are really, in fact, if you look at this, it's multi magnified 20,000 times there and to be able to see the, the, that uh, particle of Montmorillonite clay there. So, and in this particular case, it can get up as high as 800 uh, square meters per gram. So one gram of that could cover a surface area of 800 square meters. So again, it has a huge surface area and it's tiny. Well, why are we talking about clay? Well, clay is one of the worst actors that we have in, in terms of subgrade soils. In fact, it is the worst actor. we. We have and some of the problems that are associated with clay is that they're very moisture sensitive and when we say moisture, moisture sensitive is they can expand they have a tremendous expansion uh, potential and, and tremendous swell pressure so you can get swell pressures of up to 30,000 psi uh, and that's enough to move anything that's built on top of it so a concrete pavement if you got an expansive clay under it it can blow that concrete pavement up you have a building foundation it's going to move that building so it uh, really, I think people just really underestimate how expansive clay is. We also know that it's, it exhibits poor pavement support. So it means it's a weak material. So when it's wet, so clay, if it's dry, it has some pretty good strength properties. But when it gets wet, it, has, it uh, approaches zero strength. So regardless of how you measure it in terms of modulus value or unconfined compressive strength, clay, uh, when wet, has very poor strength properties. Uh, it also causes a lot of constructability problems. If you've ever tried to bid out on a project that has a lot of clay soils, you see that it, 
that you have poor workability. Uh, you see in the picture here that it's sticking to the tires of that truck, so that can cause a problem to start with. Uh, if you're trying to build pavements on top of this, it, it does what we call yielding or pumping the pavement. So if you're trying to build and you've got a paver going on it, the actual pavements, you can, really can't get good compaction when the pavement underneath the, the subgrade is moving. So it's really just difficult to build anything on top of an expansive clay. Where the expansive clays are in Texas, uh, this is just showing the frequency, and you've probably seen this chart a number of times, but I'll go over it one more time. The, and that doesn't mean that, so expansive clays can be found anywhere in Texas. For example, far out in far west Texas, there are some areas that have some expansive clays, but the most, the majority of them are along this I-35 corridor. So you see the ones in red and yellow here, all the way from the north of DFW, all the way down to the Laredo area, down into the valley all the way over Houston. So you see some really highly expansive uh, clay soils there. Also, if you look at our rainfall in Texas, it runs from uh, in Beaumont area from about 54 inches a year down to about 14 inches a year. So you have water, uh, a lot of variation in how much rainfall we get and you got clay. That clay is gonna wanna move around all the time. And by the way, all the people in Texas, about 80% of them li live in the area that's from this I-35 and to the right, so or to the east. A lot of the construction is built right on top of expansive clays. So we have to do have a way to deal with those expansive clays. So I want to show this chart here. This is the one that uh, going back to TxDOT's guidelines on what type of stabilization that you should use for different types of uh, subgrade material, starting with what we call a coarse grain material as a gravel. And if you get into the sands and silt, and actually sand is a little bit coarser than silt. Uh, and as you move towards the really fine materials like clay, uh, a couple of things happen. Not only does the size get get progressively smaller as you go this way, but the the plasticity index goes goes up. So you can have clays uh, that have up up in the hundred uh, pi range where these are just highly expansive clays. So what you find out is for clay soils, Textot has a recommendation that anything that has a pi above fifteen, uh, you should probably be using lime to stabilize that clay soil. Your only other choice, really logical choice, is to use a lime fly ash combination. Uh, this used to be a little bit more popular, but fly ash has gotten increasingly, increasingly difficult to find. There's just not uh, plentiful quantities of fly ash out there. So you don't see a lot of fly ash used much more in, in the state of Texas. Uh, if you're using coarse grain materials, if you've got sand or gravel, uh, you can use asphalt, you can use Portland cement, anything that can kind of glue those together. But when you're talking about the really fine grain materials, the clays that have the high PI, you want to be looking at using lime. And for some of the reasons I pointed out earlier, this is just another graphic of that. And I, and I took off some of the, the detail just to show you textile recommendation, a PI above 15, use lime. If your PI is less than 15, you're probably going to use like in a sandy soil, something like Portland cement or if you got a gravel or something like that that you're trying to do a stabilized base or something, asphalt, uh, typically PI less than six, and then the combination of lime fly ash down here. But basically it's that increasing PI. As you get increasing PIs, you need to be looking at using lime rather than anything else. Okay, as far as the benefits of soil stabilization with lime, I want to, there's some several choices you have. So first of all, if you have a, if you have a, nasty, uh, a nasty clay soil, you're either gonna lime stabilize it in place or you're gonna to have to bring in select fill. Well, select fill is increasingly difficult to find. It's hard to find good quality sources of select fill. In fact, a lot of times the fill material that you're bringing in can sometimes be just as bad as what you're hauling out. So not only is it very expensive, it can also be uh, of questionable quality at times. So that's something you have to watch out for. So basically, if you stabilize it in place, you've, you've saved the cost, but plus you've also just improved the, the performance characteristics of that soil. So what lime stabilization also does, it provides a good stabilized, uniform uh, paving layer. Uh, all construction lacks uniformity, whether you're building a house, whether you're building a pavement. Uh, you, want to, you, want, you don't want hard spots or soft spots. So if you come in and stabilize uh, that clay soil with lime, then uh, you get a very uniform layer. The other thing that lime does almost uniquely, it, de it decreases or kills the expansion and swelling potential of that clay soil. Uh, so uh, that's a unique property that you really want to get by using that line. It improves the foundation support. I think we've talked a number of times in some of the past podcasts that 
you uh, typically get can get three to five times the strength of the of the native subgrade material, uh, the subgrade clay, if you stabilize it with a uh, with the lime. So you're you're giving good long-term strength, and which is my last point here. You're achieving long-term strength and performance when you when you stabilize it in place, and that strength will increase over time. It goes you know five years, ten years, fifty years. We've got pavements that are down. Some of them approaching seventy years in Texas where they continue to inc increase in strength where we've uh, stabilized some of these clay soils. So that's a little bit about what makes uh, clay a unique uh, subgrade material. It is the most problematic thing we deal with in Texas and that fortunately we have lime where calcium oxide is the most logical choice that you have when you're trying to deal with those, uh, those types of soils to, to improve them and to, to uh, build a good suitable foundation on. So. I want to thank everybody for your time today, uh, for joining us for this podcast. And if you have any questions about either clay soils and, and you know, the topic that we've covered today or lime stabilization of, of clay soils, uh, please reach out to me at, the, at Dale Rand at LimeTexas.org or call me at the phone number on the slide there, 512-771-3667. Be glad to answer your questions and just appreciate you joining us today. Thank you. Thank you for watching this episode of our podcast. If you want to learn more about the use of lime, reach out to us on our website at limetexas.org. You can also email me at dalerand at limetexas.org. And please follow us on LinkedIn and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thank you for watching.